guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 159, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Mr. David Warhol. This time I have a smorgasbord of topics for you. We start off talking about Dave's time as part of the Tiger team for the Sega Saturn. Then we talk about serious games and some of the serious games that uh, Mr. Warhol has worked on, which include Remission, uh, cool School and Elect Bilat. A lot of very interesting stuff there. Then we uh, finish up by talking about the future of the gaming industry, uh, some of the uh, developments that Dave is predicting, and uh, what he looks for in a potential hire. A lot of great stuff in this interview, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Warhol. Well, you also did some work for Sega, you know, as well as the Nintendo. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, part of the, quote, Tiger team, mm -hmm. uh, unquote, yep. on the Saturn. So, you know, the Saturn, you know, seems to, didn't seem to do as well, I guess, as, you know, they had hoped. So I was just wondering what you thought about the system. Right. Um, yeah, we did, we've probably done more work for Sega than any uh, individual publisher. Uh, and that was kind of in the heyday of real-time associates stuff. Probably half, two-thirds of our work at any time was, was with Sega on a number of different platforms. Uh, the Saturn was, um, you know, we were really honored to be tapped. There were six developers that they, in the United States that they had tapped to develop for the Saturn, and um, ours was the first one released out of the North American produced titles, um, which was Bug for the Saturn. Um, it was pretty goofy architecture. I'd heard some stories about why they designed it the way they did, that uh, Motor or Hitachi had a bunch of microprocessors lying around and said, why don't you put two in each game unit instead of one? At the time, having distributed processing was kind of like, uh, what are you going to do with that? So uh, what we did in Bug, you know, to use both processors, the first thing that the first processor does is it turns off the second processor, and then the entire game is run only on the first processor, which my point was, if it's an engaging, fun, commanding experience, who cares what the technology is? You know, it's not like you got to use every single resource. It's just got to be fun. And, you know, you look at Flash games nowadays, and, you know, they're not 3D shooters, but they can still be fun. So... Uh, you know, uh, the, the development kits were non-existent. It was really tough to work on. But, you know, whereas other developers would complain about it, we're like, hey, if this gets us in, you know, hey, give us more work. We'll take it. You know, it's not going to slow us down. Bug 1 was written entirely in assembly language because there wasn't even a C compiler available at the time. And then by the time we came around to do Bug 2, um, well, even when we were releasing Bug 1, Sega couldn't support us because they were like, what? You're not working in C? You know, we can't support assembly language. This, this is a next generation console. And we're like, oh, I'm fine. And then in Bug 2, I, I think we, we made the decision to go back and rewrite the engine in C so that we could, you know, move a little more rapidly, perhaps. So we lost some of the continuity between the two product lines because of that. Just wondering if it was easier uh, to work with Sega versus Nintendo. I mean, was there any difference as far as your position was concerned? Now, I worked for Sega as a first-party developer, working directly for Sega's product development. I've never worked first-party for Nintendo, or uh, Sony for that matter, just as a third-party developer where somebody else is running into interference. You know, our publisher has that primary relationship with Nintendo or with, with a Sony. Um, so um, I think Sega was uh, pretty easy to work with, you know, all in all. Um, but I think it's because we had built up a great relationship. They understood what we could do and what we wanted to do, and you know they knew how to complement that. Um, Steve Apoor was our our main producer there on Bug and a few other titles. He was he was great to work with, um, and uh, um, no, I would say I, I would say you know these other the the third parties wanted people to program their platforms with a certain level of technical competence to make their systems look good. They didn't want to release crap. So sometimes I would submit a build, and Sony would come back and say, oh, this needs this, this, and this. And I would have to tell my publisher, well, we didn't budget for this, this, and this. You know, one of these things we could do is easy. These other things, you know, we would have had to spend another month on, and it wasn't part of our spec, you know. And, and so we would have to kind of, you know, uh, com uh, you know comply. Um, I never had that problem with Sega, but I think it might be because we were plugged in deeper earlier and, and, um, and were able to to respond to what we knew we wanted to do as opposed to kind of throw it over the wall and see what would happen. Well, with so many titles uh, from, from Real Time Associates, I'm just wondering, what are your proudest achievements? Oh, gosh. Whew. 
I didn't uh, say the, the, I'll give you more than one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Make it a little easy. Yeah. Well, I got a hundred. Uh, yeah. No, well, there's a um, hundred, yeah. Um, well, we've, we've, we've touched on a couple of them that I really like. I'm proud to be a part of Maniac Mansion, um, uh, the 8-bit eight, eight version of that, the Bug, which was like made the covers of magazines and things like that. Um, I was really, I was, we did a title for Electronic Arts called Battle Stations, which was kind of a throwback to the original Intellivision Sea Battle uh, was the high concept there. You know, I think we executed it, you know, I wouldn't call it a, a AAA title. It was probably a B title, but... We did it on a couple of platforms early on in uh, our history and in the in the market, uh, and I you know I understand that it sold like 500,000 units between the two platforms, so that was pretty good. Um, uh, I was pretty happy with, uh, however, we, we treated Qbert a couple of times on the Game Boy version of Qbert. That was kind of you know that might have even been post or pre Real Time Associates um, uh, development. Um, and there have been a number of titles that I've been proud of, um, some original stuff. We did this little game called Charlie Blast's Challenge, which was just fun to play. It was kind of like Bomberman, um, but uh, but with a different twist. Um, and um, uh, I don't know, more recently, there have been some other, uh, some other these are serious game stuff that I've been really you know glad to be a part of as well. It's, it's hard to say. You know, every single title, no matter how much publicity it got or it didn't, uh, you know, we always found something in it that was like, wow, this will make this engaging for us. You know, I, I did a lot of work for Leapfrog, uh, and while their games don't, you know, try to capture the core gamer, what we always do is look at what the client wants and find something in there that really excites us about that experience. And so there's really, you know, there's a way to get tied in with anything. So, I, you know, I'd like to think that we never really do shovelware or kind of like, yeah, okay, we'll do another game like that, as much as look at everything as an opportunity. Um, to, to bring some aspect of what we enjoy doing to a uh, game production. Well, you'd mentioned serious games, and this is a, you know, something I'm really interested in. Like, I guess some people hear the word serious games, and they think, is that an oxymoron? You know, what, what the heck is that? Uh, yeah. But, you know, I just wondered, could you tell us what a serious game is, and then some of the serious games you've been a part of? Yeah. Um, serious games is, a, is kind of a term that was coined about 10 years ago, and what it's there was just no really good term for it, and you know maybe the industry is still struggling to try to find the right the right term. But it means it, it doesn't mean games that are serious that you play with a frown on your face and that you have to pay attention. It means it really, in essence, means games that are developed where the primary motivating factor is not entertainment, is not consumer entertainment. Okay, uh, games traditionally, you know, anything you buy, uh, any store, GameStop, whatever, uh, even those that you play online. It's recreational. You're you're playing it. You're, you the the publisher makes money for making a piece of recreation that you buy. It's in, it's an entertainment product. Um, serious games are taking the technology and the genre of games, but applying it to something beyond entertainment. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, research or medical care or um, uh, you know, uh, we did one that was trying to do it like a public poll, um, a, a serious game where if you played it, the the customer was looking at what are people interested in because we would like to then report on what our people are interested in. So um, any game where where the, the funding agency, the primary motivation is not necessarily in, in a, a consumer dollars, that's what you'd call a serious game. I know one is called remission. Right. That was our first really big scale one. Yeah, I've heard of this one. This one comes up a lot in uh, academic gaming, you know, circles as a, you know, example of this genre. So, what what is remission all about? Okay, um, remission is a third-person shooter uh, that um, that's uh, that promotes a kind of wellness in cancer treatment for teens. Um, the the Hope Lab, uh, which is a not-for-profit institution, uh, its founder really had this vision that that she could make the world a better place by by releasing a video game that helped teens with cancer. You know, okay, um, preschool kids with cancer, they'll do what their folks say, and adults with cancer understand the importance of their treatment, but the, you know, the guys in their teens, they're, they don't always, you know, report things or this. So why not use the tool, use the communication methodology of the generation to speak to them on their own terms? So remission is a, you know, probably takes six to eight hours to play straight through um, full-scale third-person shooter set um, 
you know, in kind of clinically accurate scenarios uh, to 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 help kids understand what's going on in their body. Um, it, it it was developed in conjunction with medical researchers and uh, doctors, nurses, and Hope Lab gave us, for example, they gave us a list of these are the cancers we need to treat, these are the types of things we need to treat with them, and uh, and then we kind of collaborated with them to come up with the. Uh, gameplay, you know, these should be the weapons, the tuning, the level layouts, and things like that. So, um, the one thing that's what's, what's really impressive about remission is that then Hope Lab did a clinical trial which demonstrated uh, that children or teens who play this do actually take better care of themselves than teens who don't play games or teens that play another game. So, in essence, it proved, you know, five, six years ago, it proved beyond medical, you know, to the level of the, of, that the medical community um, accepts that by playing this video game, you are more likely to take take better care of yourself than by not playing it. So ergo, it's a game that 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 um, that improves your uh, potential healthcare outcome. And it was full scale. There's not a lot of them that have been done to that scope since then. But I'm, you know, I'm hoping that things will happen. Have you gotten to see the, the kids playing the game? Yeah. Uh, they had a they had a lot to do with um, with how the game was even designed and developed. What it looked like, um, our original concept of what it was going to look like inside the human body was going to be all brilliant purples and blues and kind of aurora borealis and like I wanted it to be this fantastic kingdom. This you know the final frontier was actually inside and not outside and and these heavenly kind of you know wonderful things. Except that the cancer patients who were playing it was like. No, I hate cancer. This needs to really be toned down somewhat. So, the you know we had to kind of scrap our original graphic approach and then darken the tone and the and the graphic tone of the game to kind of to match what what they're psychologically doing. Because so there's one thing we wanted to do it was it was designed for the kids, and so to that degree we we participated you know had a lot of a lot of feedback from them early on. Notice there's a couple other ones. Uh, elect Bilat. Not sure. My lad. My lad. Like and cool school. Yeah. <laughs> so about those two. Okay. Well, let's see here. Elect Bilat is um, it's a it's a role playing game. It's using the Unreal Engine even. It's a role playing game to teach uh, military commanders who are deployed in the field how to achieve their military objectives using research and negotiation. So it's a project done for the Army. It's a training tool for the Army. But it's in essence a role-playing game. Um, it was done through um, um, the Institute of Creative Technologies, which is kind of a, a think tank for the Army that takes some research uh, dollars and then tries to do innovative uh, uh, programs. So, so uh, the player is set as a commander in the field in Iraq and is presented with all of the news sources that you get, the information sources, newspapers, local TV, military intelligence, locals, you know, and then you're given a number of problems like, oh, the doctor is thinking of leaving town because it's just not safe, or there's not enough electricity and somebody keeps making the generators crash by going in and, you know, sucking the energy out of the, uh, the generators. And, you know, rather than just rolling in tanks and rolling in troops, you know, the commander has to, you know, make the right decision with limited resources. So, you know, you play yourself up through many levels of getting to know the people in town. If you help this person, will that piss these people off? And uh, and uh, so so uh, you know, it's a full scale full scale game. And, and who figured that the army was training people how to do things peacefully? You know, but uh, so that was that was the fun part about about that game was you know, yeah, it's an army project, but we're teaching people how to like get in there and solve the problems. You know, so. So that's uh, that's that's elect bilat, and it stands for bilateral negotiations. Is what the bilat is. And then um, the second one, Cool School, that you mentioned. This is a kind of an interactive movie, a very light game, but for uh, kindergartners to second or third graders. Um, uh, after the Columbine tragedy, the federal government set aside some money to help teach kids about conflict resolution, and it's kind of like. If we can get kids to work through their problems earlier on, you know, when was who who taught about you know what have you ever taught about conflict resolution? And I was talking with Jerry Ellsworth, you know, uh, Commodore Six, you know, everybody knows Jerry. Jerry Ellsworth goes, yeah, conflict resolution. When I was growing up, that was just hitting the other guy first. 
You know, so what do we ever learn about conflict resolution? Well, um, so the federal government engaged uh, through their Department of Federal Mediation and Conciliation. They're the they're a tiny agency, but they handle like conflict resolution and, and labor disputes and things like that. They were funded to create this game. Again, F.J. Lennon, the guy I worked with on the audio adventures, um, designed this game for them. And then he brought us in as a production studio. And it's kind of this fantasy game where uh, the player is brought into a fantastic school filled with uh, uh, inanimate objects that have come to life. And they have these problems and you're asked to help them reconcile their problems. And, and I really liked it because it helped us discuss things like racial tension in a very abstract way. It's kind of like the baseball and the basketball are arguing about whose sport is better. And, you know, it's like, how are you going to resolve that? Well, you you know, they give you a few. It's, it's multiple choice pretty much. And it shows you, you know, kind of works you through how to how to do that. So um, it's all done in Flash. It's web deployed. It actually just got re-released. Um, I think coolschoolgame.com or .org uh, just got re-released. Um, uh, so... You know, again, it was that it's a game. It's in the form of a game, but its primary uh, goal is to get kids to you know understand how to resolve conflicts themselves at a very early age. I notice on the Real Time Associates page, there's also some uh, want, uh, job ads. You know, there. So I was wondering, you know, as somebody who hires people, or game developers, game designers, people. I mean, what do you besides like the technical competencies and stuff like that? I mean, what do you really look for in a potential employee? Hmm. I would say there's kind of a connection that's very important. Uh, the, you know, the the ability to work in a team, but, you know, the only way I can tell that is like how they respond in an interview. Are, you know, are you immediately joking? Is it very formal? Are they distant? So so it, it's kind of like, even in our, in, our, in our employment reviews here, 60% of your, of your review is how well do you do your job? How well do you program? How well do you draw? That's only 60%. 40% of it is... How well do you work in a team? How well do you accept uh, criticism? How well are you able to push other people who might be straying from their tasks onto their tasks? You know, what kind of example of, of work do you lead? So, so it, it's for, for us anyway, you know, that kind of teamsmanship is an important part of it. And, you know, I'll let my director of technology qualify candidates, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I could tell you whether or not somebody was a good programmer. Now I just, no, no chance, you know, and same with my art director. Um, I'll let them qualify the people on their job skills. Um, but then for me, it's like, is this a person that will, you know, not only is easy to work with, but do I think would be a good addition to the kind of the, the crew that we have around us, you know, that, that get along or that you feel like having fun with when we're going out to lunch and stuff like that. So somebody were, if a teenager were to come up to you, Dave, and say, you know, I want to do this for a living, uh, what would you recommend that they do to prepare themselves? Um, teenager, I would, I would, a couple of, a couple of, um, a couple of things. The, uh, uh, I, I think the best way to get into the industry right now is through testing. If you have, if you've never done any programming or artwork or anything like that, you know, uh, and even then you'd need to be in your young twenties, uh, and getting in with a, a, a company to do testing because they have seasonal, you know, companies will have seasonal test cycles, need more people. There are temp shops that provide testers. And if you can get in with a temp shop, I, I point people at, uh, then um, then there's a, that's a good way to get in. Because if you can really show that you're a dynamic and committed tester, then they can kind of look at you and say, geez, this might be a good level design person or might be a good production kind of person. So that's a non-technical way in. Uh, technical way, of course, you've got to be a great artist. You've got to be a great programmer. Um, and so going to art school or, or technology school will be important for that. But you also have to have a love for games. And... Um, you know, I mean, playing games, it's, it's kind of like who would have figured that playing games actually was uh, I, I ditched classes in college to go play games, you know, and who would have figured that paid off. But, uh, you know, knowing what a level boss is, is really important if you're going to join a game company. So just to have being a good artist isn't enough, you know, knowing games, loving games, um, you know, at this point in time, you know, knowing game you know, game style so that you can program in, in a lot of different ways. Very important. So, you know, got to got to be the. Uh, um, there's this one anecdote that I really like, though. There's a guy who worked for me who was in high school. This was my first studio. I was literally in a garage next to a transmission repair, repair and, like, the, the, the guy's nephew would come over, and he'd help, he'd help us test, and he just was really sharp. Um, and, um, and he was deciding whether or not to go to college, and I liked the guy. I, was, I would have hired him to be an assistant producer in a second. Uh, he could have done level design. He could have done project management. 
but but he asked me, geez, Dave, uh, and English wasn't even his first language. He, he asked me, geez, Dave, should I go to college? And I'm, and, uh, and because he wanted to work in the, in games and all that. And I told him, well, uh, well, Robert, if you want to work for me, you don't have to go to college for that. But if one day you want me to work for you, then you have to go to college. And he thought about it for a second. He goes, I think I'll go to college. <laughs> so, um, he ended up working on the space shuttle program. Um, and, uh, 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 but the other thing, you, if you're going to get into this business, you need to have clear communication skills. Uh, if, even if you're a bug tester, you got to be able to communicate your, you know, what you see, problem solving communication skills, um, you know, uh, grammar, you know, there's just no getting around needing to be able to communicate with people, in, in, you know, as you're working in, in the field. So. Grammar. Yeah. <laughs> really? I had a guy who could not, could not distinguish between. Uh, apostrophes, you know, uh, it's and it's, IT apostrophe S, ITS. I couldn't let the guy write to my clients. He's a producer. I couldn't let him write to the clients because he couldn't use the grammar correctly. And it's like, you know, so, you know, didn't end up working there that long. All right. I got just a couple last uh, questions here, uh, hey. Dave. Uh, one I wanted to ask you about MVG, or music uh, for video games, or music right. video games, uh, with uh, you and Vincent Batetti. Um, you know, what was this all about? Sort of casual, uh, casual music games, right? So can you talk a little bit about MVG? Yeah, um, I guess it started probably six to eight years ago when, when whenever Guitar Hero and Rock Band were really becoming prominent, uh, maybe it was about six years ago. Uh, and, you know, I've always wanted to mix music and gameplay. Uh, I've always wanted to do something with that, but never really found a, the right end that, that really stuck. Um, and, uh, and then, um, and then, uh, Guitar Hero Rock Band came out and it was like, wow, hey, there is a consumer market for games based on popular music. Um, and at that point in time, I had devised a game mechanic that was different than the, you know, the, the kind of the note runway that you see in Guitar Hero and, and Rock Band, um, a different way to express music synchronization. And so I was shopping that around and one of the people I, I showed it to was Vincent Bettetti who had been at the time investigating this free-to-play market. And this was, you know, at a point in time when free-to-play really hadn't come here. I don't think Zynga was even doing stuff. And so he was like, I know I want to do free-to-play. I know I want to do free-to-play, but I, uh, I I don't know exactly how to do it. And then I was like, well, I want to do this music synchronization mechanic, but I don't know. It was one of those Reese's Peanut Butter Cup things where, hey, you got, you got music synchronization in my casual game. Hey, you got casual in my music synchronization game. So... We put together music video games to try to raise money to create uh, a casual uh, music sync website. You know, we were trying for our own portal. That might have been a little ambitious, but there weren't really. I don't even. You know, Facebook was in its early days at that time. I'm not even sure Facebook had opened up its uh, its um, its uh, AP to or its its uh, UI to to, to developers. Um, so we spent the better part of a year talking to venture capitalists and uh, angel investors to raise money to start uh, what in essence would have been a sister company to Real-Time Associates to do these music-based video games. Um, and, but we weren't able to, uh, you know, we gave, it a, we gave it a good nine months a year and weren't able to uh, realize that. So um, Vincent has since, you know, I've, I've lost track of him after that. I'm, I'm not sure where he's gone on to, um, but I'm still looking myself to try to uh, figure out how, how Real-Time Associates can best express music and gameplay, you know, not necessarily exactly the same way as Rock Band and Guitar Hero, um, uh, but with, you know, different different styles of mechanics. And then I have a big passion for classical music, of course, as you, we talked about my earlier work, my, you know, my degree and all that. Um, so, so right now I'm trying to figure out, well, uh, you know, what's a good way to kind of make classic, bring classical music into a music sync category. Um, so right now, music video games is is kind of a uh, it's it's just where I'm parking my thoughts until I find the right opportunity to to uh, capitalize on that. I sense a Kickstarter project in your future. Dan. That it would be an awesome Kickstarter project. But here's the other thing: is that I'm no you know I'm not a Ron Gilbert you know I'm not a name above the title kind of guy. And even though you know I've worked on, geez, games with Ron. <laughs> um, a, the um, uh, I think I would have a little more difficulty trying to break, you know, trying to get that um, get that notoriety or audience. You know, I, I worked for Brian Fargo on many of his titles. I even did 
you know, PC Wasteland. I did the sound for that, you know. But, um, but uh, you know, these are guys that have reputations and have, um, you know, really clear audiences and followings and very clear understanding of what that is. So I'd love nothing more than to uh, do a Kickstarter thing, especially, I mean, with this, with this classical music sync game. I would love to do that. Um, but um, uh, a little uh, either gun shy about, um, about, you know, the, the size of the, the budget that e- either be required to do it right or um, the, uh, you know, whether or not I could really reach the audience that would, would get out there and want to do, be associated with that. So this is the, the final question for you, Dave. Uh, it's kind of hard, I know, but it's still, that would be fun to ask. So I wonder what you, you know, somebody with all this experience in the industry, you know, seeing all these developments, uh, what does the future look like to you? What, what do you think video games would be like 10 years from now and then 20 years from now and then 50 years from now? Um, well, insofar as that 10 years ago, we really didn't know where we would be today. Um, it's, it's going to be really hard to accurately project that. Um, um, one thing that I really like, uh, that's happening, a, a trend that I really like is kind of the indie trend where, you know, five years ago, even you weren't, you know, you could not do a triple a, um, innovative product. I mean, it was just, it had to be a franchise, had to have a Roman number two after it had to be a sports game. You know, there was no such thing as, you know, all of the games were really, there were five categories and five categories only, and that's it. And, but now that, that game development is so ubiquitous that, you know, that indies can get out there and self-publish in, in essence, we're finding some real gems and some real talent. And, uh, you know, I, I played Journey, for example, which is not only a great, you know, independent, yeah, it had Sony behind it, uh, but, uh, but it was a AAA title. It was a small title, but easily AAA. Um, so, you know, what I'm excited about are going to be the true expressions of emotional, you know, uh, emotions besides testosterone, you know, in, in games um, that will come from these pools of, of real raw talent and, and raw vision. So, so I think very much like David Lynch or Spike Lee, these are guys that started off with really small projects and then were handed enormous you know, opportunities and projects and, and really make great artistic statements. We're going to see some or more of that. And I know there's, there's a few people out there that this is already happening with, uh, but um, that's, that's what interests me the most. Uh, you know, I'll let other people speculate as to whether or not uh, it's all going to be free to play or is the console dead? You know, I still think that a high-end graphic experience is, is really compelling. And I would rather, uh, you know, if I were going to do, say, my favorite game, I would rather do it in a, you know, PlayStation 3, Xbox, uh, Live Arcade, a kind of environment than I would a Flash game. Yeah, Flash reaches more people, but the, yeah, I think the level of immersion and, and entertainment, um, you know, it, it's just, well, it's my background, you know. Um, but there's another interesting thing about, you know, how games, you know, 50 years out. I recently, at one of the serious game summits I was at, uh, the, 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 closing, the closing speaker uh, pointed out that, you know, so much more of, of our life is games than we even think that it is. You know, yeah, there's, you're sitting down in front of the computer, sitting down in front of a console, you're playing games. Well, you know, what about our sports lives? You know, yeah, you might be playing sports. That's a game. Okay, part of our life. You might even be watching sports. You're enjoying a game. It's a, still a sport to know all these statistics. He goes further and further on. He says, you know what? What about shopping? Shopping is a game. You get a coupon for something. Well, geez, I, should I use this coupon that gives me 10% off my whole purchase or 20% off on an item? That's kind of gaming. And so his point was we can bring games into more part of our lives, but I'm going to see that more part of our lives will either have that entertainment or the, the kind of the games in them, that it'll be less of a turning it on and turning it off as it will be, you know, just uh, kind of an, uh, I don't know, an entertainment feed uh, into a little uh, intravenous, you know, tube into our brain or whatever. Um, so uh, less, you know, we'll see less stigma about them and, and more, more acceptance. Of course, uh, I think when um, uh, we were talking earlier, we we're talking about, um, you know, uh, people uh, outside of games not wanting to, you know, serious games or, or uh, people who did not grow up with games don't know how much they can change you or influence you or reach you. And as we, uh, as the, as the population ages, more and more people are going to have played games and we'll understand that. And so we'll just naturally find more, more applications for them uh, beyond just the, the computer and the rec room. 
that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new retrospective, unless I am too depressed, because not a single one of you guys has submitted a video introduction. Now guys, I'm not expecting a big production out of this, uh, just a 10 to 20, maybe 30 second clip of yourself. Uh, just tell me who you are, where you're from, the game you'd like me to look at, and then a little bit about why you like the game. That's it, that's all. I'll put it in the clip. It should be lots of fun. So guys, come on, I need you uh, to step up to the webcam and uh, send me a link to the video. Really greatly appreciate that. I think it's going to be fun. As always, I want to thank everyone who has been donating to the show. It really means a lot to me, guys. You're keeping these episodes coming. If you like Matt Chat, that's the best way to show you care. <laughs> All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week, I've got something I really, really enjoy. Um, this is a Tommyknocker Imperial Nut Brown Ale brewed with pure maple syrup. This is 9% alcohol by volume, uh, roughly twice what you would get with a Budweiser. All right, so I have a little Tommy Knocker Imperial here in the old rather excellent drinking ornaments, uh, sniffing this. It's got quite nice, got kind of a chocolate, maybe a little cinnamon uh, kind of thing going there, like a chocolate soldier or a bowl of cinnamon toast crunch, one of my favorite cereals. Well, let's give it a taste. Ah. Oh, that's, that's so good. Kind of chocolatey, nutty. You know, this actually was a... If you ever had a bowl of, of good uh, terrapin soup with some Rocky Mountain oysters and maybe a, a glass of uh, Milk of Mermaid, uh, that's sort of the flavor combination I'm detecting here. It's quite, quite nice. I uh, highly recommend this. Uh, definitely uh, one of the best ales I've had in a long time. I'm going to go for the full 5 out of 5 drinking horns on the old uh, drinking horn scale. Get, a, get some of this if you possibly can. You will not be disappointed. All right, let's uh, finish up with a quotation, and the uh, quotation this week comes from Mr. Anonymous, and it goes something like this. A drug is defined as a substance that, when injected into a rat, produces a scientific report. See you guys next week. You have to understand, drugs can make you feel good.